this is National Master Spencer Feingold back at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta with a Great Players of the Past lecture. It's been a while since we did a new lecture here on the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta's YouTube, but uh, thought, you know, might as well produce a new one during the pandemic. Uh, no audience, because we're still closed here at the Chess Club, but um, still, you know, put out some good information. So let's just jump on into it. We've got, uh, it'll be, a Great Players will be check over. That's who I'll be talking about today. And we'll be looking at some of his games, his best games, his best wins over great players uh, that we've done before even, such as Smyslov, that'll be the first game. Um, and also some, uh, some positions of his as well. Just uh, not the whole game, but the ending position, because he had a lot of nice combinations at the end of his games. So I wanted to show off some of those. But all right, let's take a look at this first game. He has black, so let me flip it. All right. Um, again, against Vasily Smyslov, they play Karol Khan, which is something that Smyslov would play as black, so that's kind of funny. And check over, oh, it's a two knights, and check over takes, which um, has kind of a bad reputation, but he plays it the best way that you can play it. Uh, most people, most grandmasters, they play either bishop g4, sort of the old main move, and also there's this uh, more common move, knight f6, uh, more modern move, I should say that uh, it's very sharp and interesting and, and a very forcing line there. So those are the main two options, but taking is not so bad. As long as you follow it up like how uh, Chekover did, he played knight f6. And a lot of people, they'll play this way um, if, for example, instead of knight f3, they play d4 with white. A lot of people will play this way with knight f6 here and accept this pawn structure that uh, Chekover does accept after the exchange. Uh, so I should mention that a lot of times people who are sort of new to the Karakhan, they'll take here and they'll play bishop f5, pretending like it's a normal, it's a normal Karakhan with d4 instead of knight f3. Um, but with the knight on f3, this is actually worse. And there are a lot of games that continue this way. Knight g3, bishop g6, which also, by the way, you should play bishop g4 if you do this h4. This is like sort of the main line, right? But with if white had played d4 instead of knight f3. And this is the difference. And now here we can play knight e5 with white. And bishop h7. You should actually, I don't even know what you should, oh, queen d6 I think is the move. But black doesn't want to give up that white square bishop for a knight, obviously. So most people will just retreat. Threatening on uh, mate on f7. Has to play g6. Now, a lot of times people play bishop c4 with white here, which I've done myself, but that's not as good, because white can actually win material by force. Queen f3, threatening f7, mate again, has to go here. And then queen b3, threatening mate and threatening on b7. Queen d5, it looks like, well, maybe this is a little risky, but indeed you should take on b7, give up the knight with check and block it, and white's winning. He's gonna win that rook and just be up material. And uh, look at that bishop on h7, not great. <laughs> not a great bishop. Not the kind of bishop you want to uh, want to bring home to mother, right? So, yeah, that's why, by the way, queen h5 to provoke, and then queen f3 is better than queen f3 at once. So if you're playing a Karo Khan with black, don't play this variation. There's, Like I said, I outlined many things you could do instead, such as knight f6 here. Or uh, if you don't like to play this pawn structure, then you should play bishop g4 instead of de. Or if you want to learn a lot of theory, play knight f6. <laughs> takes, takes, knight f6. Takes, takes. So we get this structure where white has uh, four against three majority on the queen side um, against black, who has four against three on the king side, but they're doubled. So this is actually a pretty bad doubled pawn. It looks like it's really solid, and both sides have two pawn islands, so it's not that bad. And it's true in, in that way. It's, it's not like they're weak pawns for black, but he does have a worse pawn majority. In a king and pawn endgame, if you just traded everything away, black is actually probably just losing. You know, maybe you can confirm that at home. Like, if you have chess space, just put this position, take all the pieces except kings and pawns off the board, and play through it see how you do, because I think white should win that. Um, so that's kind of the problem in this variation for black. That's the only problem, really, um, is that in the long term, the end game is going to be bad. But, uh, you know, he's solid, he's going to get easy development, and, and it's kind of an easy opening for black to play. 
both sides castle. H3, most people play either D4 or Rook E1 here. D4 would transpose to if they white plays D4, I like got move 2 instead of Knight C3 and Knight F3. So, um, if you want to like play differently for some reason with white, you could play Rook E1. Uh, that's sort of what Smyslov's trying to do. He's playing H3 for that reason. Um, he's trying to like not play into a D4 like sort of a main line, I guess, but plays d4 anyway. Yeah, right here. So it doesn't really, uh... Oh, I guess he waited for queen c7, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, all right, in the next few moves, there won't be too many comments here. Because, uh, they're pretty self-explanatory moves, don't you think? He gets an isolated pawn. He could have played d5, in case you're wondering, but it's not so bad to have a, a passed d pawn, even if it is isolated. Just has Kramnik and every Grunfeld he's ever played. And uh, I think that, you know, check over is getting outplayed a little bit here by Smyslov. Smyslov playing some standard isolated queen pawn moves here. I like knight h4 as well. And queen h5 is good. Threatening f7, of course, so he defends that. He doesn't want to have to play g6 with his pawn to weaken the dark square so much. And knife f5. All right. So here, actually, Checkover makes a mistake and is is just losing, as it turns out. Um, he should just move his rook, which he did, but he threw in an intermezzo check. Bishop h2. Check. Check over, right? <laughs> so king h1. And then he moves his rook. But the problem is that his bishop on h2 is actually pretty poorly placed, as you might imagine. Um, Smyslov didn't take advantage of it. This might be a good moment for you at home to pause and try to find the best move for white. Just give you a second there to do that. Um, because Smyslov couldn't find it. He ends up playing queen g4. The correct move is going to be bishop d3. Kudos to you if you found that one because uh, that wouldn't be very obvious to me. <laughs> but the point is to, the, the, the first point of many, is to uh, trade off those white square bishops. Um, which, if the white square bishop's gone for black, then white can follow up with g3, because it's not pinned anymore, and trap the h2 bishop. So, uh, by the way, if you said g3, instead of bishop d3, that's illegal, but the right idea, <laughs> definitely. So let's say um, there's a lot of ways that this game could go from here. Like the computer is recommending to play takes, queen takes, threatening on h, and then g6 to stop that, followed by queen takes f6. But I thought, well, if I had black and I was trying to defend here and not give up any material, what would I play? I would probably trade bishops, first of all. I would notice my bishop on h2 is going to be trapped, so I'd just move it. But, okay, so here's the problem. This is like the real critical variation. So if you saw bishop d3 somehow and then calculated this variation, maybe you were thinking there wasn't too much here. Um, but there is a forcing variation. Uh, again, this might be another good moment to pause if you, if you didn't get this far. But okay, uh, I'll just go ahead and show it. Knight takes g7. x clam. Really good move. Um... Well, that can't be tolerated. We have to take the knight, otherwise it's losing for black. Although, of course, taking the knight's going to be losing. Spoiler alert. Check. If we go to g8, we'll get checked here. So we have to go to h8, of course. And then still queen g4, threatening on g7. There's only one way to stop mate in one. Just making sure that that's correct. But yeah, there's only one way. You have to play rook g8 which loses your d7 rook. Chomp. So after all that, white continues his attack, of course, but is up in exchange and even clipped a pawn. So this would be a very easy win. Very easy for Smyslov to clean that up. I think Smyslov's won endgames that are like barely winning or not winning, so I'm <laughs> sure he'd have a field day there. So bishop d3 actually wins by force. Um, a very difficult move to find, I would say, and I don't really blame Smyslov or Chekhov for missing this continuation. 
you have to understand the ideas to trap the bishop on h2, but you also have to calculate if they just trade and move their bishop, how do I win? Which, even if Smyslov saw bishop d3 and thought it was a potentially winning move, he could have seen the trade and moving the bishop back and thought, I don't really know what how to win there. But, uh, but yeah, he had knight g7 in that position. So he first of all plays queen g4, threatening the bishop on e4, as well as the g7 pawn. And so we have to take the knight. Queen takes back. And uh, check over plays a nice move here. Bishop e5, taking advantage of the pin. Uh, Smyslov misses a little tactic. It actually doesn't win material, but it, uh, it would have been the best way to go. He plays bishop b5, but he should try if bishop takes f7 check. Which I think he, he probably saw this because it's just checks. The point is that we get this check so that we can protect our rook on d1. And in this way, we can take the e5 bishop without losing our rook on d1. So we gave up the bishop on f7 to win the bishop on e5, like this. And it's possible he saw this and thought it was pretty boring, and he wanted a little bit more to try to win. You know, that would be fair. That's just my guess. So he played bishop b5, which keeps a lot of tension in the position. And it also, I mean, it looks like a pretty good move, because it uh, pins the knight and... Black is obviously putting a lot of pressure on d on d4, so white is trying to uh, alleviate that pressure uh, offensively, if you want to look at it that way. So let's kick, make a little lift, and f5, okay, queen b8, uh, but he can go ahead and take it. Yeah, he can go ahead and take the pawn, he also could have taken without playing f5. But um, the bishop g5 is coming. And this is basically forcing a pin. Right? We, we made the rook move away. Could have played f6, but never play f6. So we didn't. And because the rook's not defending the rook on d7, they're undoubled, he's, uh, the bishop on d4 is, is pinned. Basically, that's all there is to it. So this is kind of tough. For black, even though he's up a pawn. And by the way, don't forget, he's up a pawn, but it's this doubled f pawn. So in an end game that might not win, or maybe in a king and pawn end game, but like in a rook end game, it might not even be winning if he gets out of this pin. Queen e5. Alright, uh, hitting the bishop on b5. And here Smyslov doesn't uh, defend the best. And actually gets into a precarious situation. Uh, he should just defend his bishop with a4. You can look at that variation, a4. Now, uh, I was concerned personally about the move a6. I kind of forgot what the computer suggested here for black, but it wasn't a6 exactly, although a6 isn't bad. Um, th but here's the deal, is that all we have to do is uh, is get rid of this queen, kick away the queen from the bishop on d4. If he insists, we can offer a trade even. And he'll be like, okay, let me trade and win your bishop, right? Free bishop, except bishop on uh, d4 is loose. So if we move our knight like knight a7 to protect the rook on c8, he'll take with, I guess either rook you could take with, and, uh, and win back the piece. Um, even here, black is probably better, though, with with best play, like by playing knight a7, I suppose. Maybe he had some other move, though. I don't think there's only one move, but black is going to be just fine here. I mean, he's he lost back his pawn, but both sides have doubled pawns, and uh, whites are obviously worse. They're double isolated pawns, so we can try to go collect those. And his bishop on g5 isn't great right now, although it could be good if he plays bishop f6 later and gets on that long diagonal. It's not a huge deal. So, but that would be okay for white. It would be okay for both sides. Queen d3 is what he played immediately. He's got a little tactical trick here, um, is, is Smith's Law's point. But um, with the best play, black could get a pretty serious advantage, close to winning, um, which he didn't quite execute, unfortunately, for Chakover. Um, 
but I was hoping you at home could find it. So this would be a, a good opportunity to pause and, and see if you can find the best continuation for black. Well, hopefully you, uh, you thought of the right first move at least, free bishop, right? And you probably thought, well, what is, uh, what is Mislav going to do about that? He's going to take here. And now this is really the big question, is, is what capture do I make here? Because the queen is hanging and the rook is hanging. And we can take the rook with the knight or the rook. We can also trade queens. And Chekover didn't pick the right choice. He took with the queen, trading queens. Which probably leads to about an even endgame. He should play rook takes d4 x clan. Which this basically forces the two rooks for queen scenario. White has no choice other than to take the queen. And then we'll take the other rook with check. And then move our rook back. Basically getting a position where he has two rooks and a pawn for a queen. Which is great. I mean, two rooks and a pawn are way better than a queen. In fact, uh, two rooks are usually worth about a queen and a pawn. So to have basically two extra pawns in that case, if you think about it, um, should definitely benefit black. So why didn't he go for this? I mean, he definitely saw it, but he was afraid that his king would be weak on the dark squares. You know, he doesn't want the guy to play bishop h6. And, and I mean, the problem is he can't get his queen on this diagonal, right? So it would take several turns. And in the meantime, we could play a move like f6 because we actually have really good control of our 7th rank. Maybe he thought he couldn't win this anyway because his king would be so weak. Which, that's the only problem, is that his king is weak. And if he can uh, secure his king, then he'll be maybe even winning. But if he can't, then probably not. But even still, it's sort of like the defensive pressures on white, even though it's a, it's a weak king for black. White has to play to, white can't really play to win, unless black hangs mate, which he's probably not going to, I would assume. So he didn't go for that exchange, but if that's what you had decided, it's really more of a judgment call than a calculation situation, uh, but you have to obviously calculate that variation. So if that's what you saw here after queen d3, then good on you. But he actually traded queens and then traded rooks and then uh, he was afraid of rook d7, and rightfully so, so he played rook c7. Alright, let's uh, go through this. These next few moves, bishop f6. Like I said, this is pretty close to even. I mean, white's bishop's better than the knight, uh, but black is up a pawn. But it is a doubled pawn. I think, I mean, most people would rather be up the pawn, though. Okay, king g8. Dancing around here. He doesn't have to worry about rook d8 check, which would be mate, but the knight can take it. And uh, a6. Okay, Smyslov gets it going over there. And uh, check over does a good job, you know. He's got four against three on the king side, and so he finally tries to push it here in the next few moves. Has to move all his pawns up. It looks kind of weird, definitely. No, black's not winning here. Black's not even better. And uh, g5, yeah. Kind of has to do that anyway, unless he wants to play a passive move like knight f7, but I don't think he really wants that. Yeah, so he, he clipped the pawn. But check over had a good idea. He's just playing g4. Yeah, he's trying to make a break on the king side, and this will maybe net a passed pawn, but it will also put some pressure on the king. As we'll see, Smyslov doesn't handle that pressure accurately. Takes because his f-pawn is actually hanging. And rook d6 intermezzo, hitting the bishop. Here comes another intermezzo check. And takes here. And now here's where Smyslov actually, I think he gives it up here, yeah. The last note of the game. Uh, it's a tough position. And what he, what he gets in the game is basically the same as what he should have done, but a little bit slower, a little bit worse. Um, so let's see if you guys can, maybe you can pause and try to find the, the best defense 
for Smyslov in this position. Well, definitely a move that you should have thought of uh, was to take on b6. It's a capture after all. And, um, well, we're attacking the f6 pawn, right? So we have to say, what is, uh, what is Black's plan? He wants to play his pawn to g3, right? And then he wants to put his knight in here, and, and then it's mate. So this is what Smyslov has to avoid. If he plays g3 now, though, it's rook takes f6. Then if he follows up with his knight, it's rook g6 check, forking the king and knight, which would be an easy win, of course. So that's why black would have to play a preparatory move before playing g3, king f7. Now if, it's, if white just plays, for example, a, a5, a6, a7, a8, black mates with g3, knight g4, knight f2. Um, so, white has to play the move king h2. Um, we can throw in this check, and then king h2. The problem with this is that after g3 check, we're going to win the bishop. Um, but, it's two connected pass pawns for the knight. And, well, this might be a draw. It might be winning for black. I would guess it's a draw, just with uh, no analysis at all. Because, I mean, you could spend all day analyzing this. But um, we don't have to know that, right? It's impossible to know if this is a draw or a win. Who cares? The point is that we can compare this to what actually happened in the game. He played king h2 immediately. The difference here is that after g3 check, takes, takes, rook takes b6, he actually gets time for the move, the great move, rook f1. Really nice. Really good stuff. Boxing in the white king, which white didn't have to worry about that in this position. It's white's turn, white can move his king, like to f2 for example. And uh, it'll be all right. Now, I guess white's king, I mean, sorry, black's king is a little bit better, too. But um, we're trying to, like, weave a mating net around the white king. So if we let his king out of there, um, it's going to be beneficial to white. And I think that Smyslov, this is not, like, a situation where you have to calculate it very accurately. You just have to understand that that's what, that's what both sides want. White wants to get the king out, and black wants to box it in and protect his pawn. So, um, this is actually winning now. It's that much of a difference. Let's look. I mean, it's already close to winning before, so I guess any small benefit could push it over. Or check it over, I should say. A6. Yes, and now the white king is beginning to feel pretty uncomfortable. Even though it's queen time. Yeah, he sort of just did this to distract the rook, because now he can't defend the pawn. He can't play rook f7, the knight will take it. So, like this. Yeah, still boxing in the king. Check, check. Rook b3, threatening mate in one. Rook b1 mate. So he steps out of that. And uh, he plays rook b4. He could have just taken the pawn. After rook b4, it resigns. Um, I guess the logical continuation would be something like b6. And then probably this knight would go ahead and... Well, maybe there it would be check, though. Hmm, I think he would... Oh, no, no, I know. He would go for, uh, I was going to say this check, and then here, but it's the same problem. Well, I think he will get to c4. He'll just have to so sort of slowly do that. Um, he could just not care about the check, or he could play, for example, king e4 as a preparatory move, or king e5. Um, I would say it's a little early to resign, but the deal is that you cannot trade black's last pawn away on f5. White can't trade that away for, like, the g pawn. just not going to happen. And so, 
Black's going to take his time to clean up the B pawn, then the H pawn, and then win a knight up. Um, so Smyslov, uh, he understood that, and check over, definitely win this. No doubt about it. So it's, uh, it's a resigns. Really tough game there by Smyslov and check over. Uh, this game was from 1945. So I would assume that Smyslov's somewhat young. <laughs> I would assume so. But it is a USSR championship, so it's not like he was a joke player. But yeah, it was a really, uh, I was just looking back at the notation, really interesting game. The opening was like kind of boring. It was that knight f6, uh, Karo Khan, but it got really interesting positionally. Uh, he had the isolated pass d pawn, and there were some mistakes, like uh, when, when Chekover got his bishop trapped over here on h2, that wasn't correct, um, obviously. And then bishop d3 would have been a nice win. But uh, overall, a really nice game, and uh, Chekover beat, you know, future world champion, so there's, uh, you know, no shame in that, <laughs> definitely. But all right, let's take a look at the next one, huh? Nope. Here we go. Here he has white, so we have to flip it again. Hey, when that happens, but you know, <laughs> what are you going to do? All right, so here, check over with white. Uh, has a clear and obvious positional advantage, I think. I mean, even, you know, scholastic players would understand that. Uh, the bishop on b7 is garbage. The pawn structure with all these pawns on white squares is definitely hindering black, whereas all the pawns on dark squares is good for white. And his bishop's amazing because of that. He's, his rooks are better. I mean, everything's looking good. C6 is weak. B4 is even weak. His only pawn that's on a dark square. Um, and obviously the C file is dominated by white. So Rudo Ru Rudakovsky is uh, in a bad way here. He's already lost queen a7. Uh, check over makes a nice forcing move here. Threatening mate in one. Gotta respect that. And he goes for g6. Weakening the dark squares even more. Queen f6. Rook d6. Just protecting c6, I suppose. And also trying to get maybe something like this going. Or queen a8, whatever, to, to, to d8. Uh, queen e7. Rook fd8. And now check over starts playing really strong moves here from here on out. Although all these moves that we looked at were pretty good too. <laughs> um, but okay, this would be a good time to find a, a good plan for white. How is white going to continue even though he's a pretty serious positional advantage? What can he do to make some progress? Alright, uh, maybe you were thinking, oh, my back rank is weak, so I might as well make some luft, right? And check over is right behind you with that idea. But he did a multi-purpose move, so if you thought about h4, really nice idea. Trying to get a nice pawn break in on h5, and potentially even continuing with h6, as the game, uh, as the game does. But also, uh, like I was saying, a, a nice benefit is that we never have to worry about back rank mate. That's just a, a nice plus that we're getting here. It's a really good aggressive move that also solidifies the back rank. Gotta love a multi-purpose move. Hits the queen. But he saw it. He's pretty good. And queen a8. And again, check over displays all super strong moves here. Uh, he starts off with bishop e4. Really nice stuff. Not the move I would have played, but it's the best move. Puts a little bit of pressure on c6. It also stops the move rook d5 and to trade the rooks. Queen e8. Yeah. Um, another thing is that, you know, when he moves the queen, right, he's going to lose the c pawn. So uh, if you play a move like queen d8, white could trade queens and then pick it up and win a pawn and win that endgame. So this bishop e4 move, it put uh, Rudikovsky in a bind. 
he doesn't want queens on the board because his king is getting crushed, but he also doesn't want to be in a lost endgame. So it's sort of pick your poison at that, at that point. Here, and sort of a, a little trick, if you take everything on c6, he can play discovered, rook takes d4, so he's sort of defending this by x-ray. And so um, check over is like, okay, I could try to take on c6, but let me just go for h5, playing on both sides of the board. Really nice. He does back it up to d8. Now he's defending c6 securely. Um, but definitely this is a moment to pause and try to find the way in, because check over started to play some tactics here that won him the game. So, uh... Yeah, this would be a good time for some reflection. Well, if you found the move bishop takes c6, pretty good tactically. <laughs> really nice. It looks like Rudikovsky, uh, he tried to defend his c-pawn, and maybe he thought, okay, I defended it three times, so he won't take it. But when you calculate, you'll see that the queen is overloaded. She needs to defend the rook on d8. So this does indeed clip the pawn. Takes. And even throws in h6. Threatening mate, really nice. Uh, there's two ways to stop it. You could stop it with the queen. Obviously, he would take back on c6 then because it deflected your queen. He played king f8 instead. Takes, takes, takes. Still, you can't take the rook because I'll take your rook with check and even force the queen trade if I want to be in an easily winning king and pawning game. Uh, so. He plays rook d7. And there's actually more than one winning move here, so uh, you, know, you don't really have to pause and think about it. But you could try to find one. Um, he found the easiest one, rook c8. Definitely what I would do. Queen g7 check is also pretty good, but this wins a queen after it takes queen h8 check. A bit of a deflection there, or attraction, I guess, actually. I'm winning the queen, and prompting resignation by Rudikovsky. So really good game by check over there. We sort of, uh, we only saw the end because, uh, well, I mean, it was kind of boring. <laughs> it was a little boring. He just had a nice positional advantage because Rudikovsky played a little too passively, as you could have imagined. Um, but it's not so easy to beat an opponent when they're uh, pretty strong. Rudikovsky probably no joke with a name like that. And uh, also, not only is he pretty strong, but he's not making... Uh, He's not making huge tactical blunders, and he's, he's sort of putting the onus on you to, to put the pressure and, and find the win. But check over, you know, he can do it. As we'll see in the, in the next couple of clips as well, he, uh, he definitely knows how to, how to make a winning tactic if he's got one, and put some pressure to, uh, to force that scenario. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. He has black as every time I've got to flip it. All right. So you might be looking at this position and thinking, all right, Chekover has black here against Makaganov, a pretty famous player. Makaganov's known for the h3 King's Indian defense when white plays an early h3, which I've played myself, actually. Uh, you might be thinking if when you're looking at this position that Makaganov with white is uh, just winning, right? Because he's got uh, three against one on the queen side. Easy pass, already a passed A pawn, but he's going to play B4 and get two passed pawns out of that deal. Maybe, I mean, his king is a little weak, but what is, what is uh, check over to do? How is he going to get his rook in there for the attack? Sort of the best that check over could hope for is perpetual check. Perpetual check over. So, um, he plays kind of a strange move, I'm not going to lie. Although, it, I think this move won him the game, uh, even though he's losing. He is losing. But um, he induced some blunder from Makaganov with the move G5. So if you were thinking about that move, then you're a pretty creative player, because I probably would not do that unless I guess I was pretty desperate. Like, he's, I guess, in a desperate scenario. Makaganov handles it well on Passat. 
followed by a very strong move, rook d6. And it's uh, already starting to look like lights out. Not only is the end game bad, but his black's king is pretty weak too. And g6 is under threat, so he plays queen h5. And then queen f6. And now I, oh, I actually miss, um, misnotated here. Uh, just like the annotation. So, he goes for the best try here. Might as well give him the check, right? Check over. Queen g4, I actually put that as a blunder, but it's not. Not a blunder. The next move that Makaganov plays is a blunder, actually. So, queen g4 check. And uh, Makaganov does have a winning way to go here, but he blunders and he blunders so bad it's actually losing. Sad. <laughs> Sad X Clan. So, definitely a good time to pause and try to find the best way for Checkover to win this position. So, you might have noticed if you were looking that going to the H file isn't making a lot of progress because black can just check back on h5, right? So that would just force you back to the g file where he'd play queen g4 check. So that's not really going to win the game immediately. Uh, you got to move your king to the f file, f1 or f2. That way when you get checked, you can just run away to the queen side, easy. King on d2 is going to be secure. So the question is, which one are you going to do? Are you going to play f2 or f1? One of them wins and one of them loses, and unfortunately for Makaganov, he picked a losing move. He played king f2, blunder. So if you got this far and, and thought that maybe this is the winning way for white, well, you're right there with Makaganov, but hopefully uh, you can find the, the win for black now. So maybe if you didn't get this far, you probably should pause and try to figure it out. Right, I think the first move is pretty easy to find. Right, pin the tail on the donkey, <laughs> rook f8, getting the queen and king lined up. And Makaganov saw this, he's not so bad, so he thought, I'll just play rook d8. Right, counter pin. Unfortunately, Makaganov missed this move by check over. Hopefully you guys all saw queen h4 check, taking advantage of the pin on the queen, and it's a fork, and Makaganov has to resign. This is why, as you could imagine, king f1 would be winning. King f1, if we do the same thing here and there, there's no fork. If you play queen h4, I'll just take your rook with jack, or take the rook and, and mate you in two, either way. Or if you play like some other check, he can, uh, he can try to run away. Um, actually, I'm just noticing, though, here it would still be queen h4, right? Let me see if we can figure this out. Check. I mean, not check, but pin. Pin. Check. Because, yeah, I was going to try to run away, but then uh, queen h4 check still, right? No, no, because it's not pinned. That's why. What am I talking about? King, a King e1. This check doesn't work anymore because it's not pinned here. Well, that's why we can take. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty obvious, actually, when you look at it. <laughs> it's got to get it on the board for me there. Yeah, so he has to run away on the white squares. Even though he's going to e1, then it won't be pinned. So queen h4 check isn't allowed. So king f1 would have been a really delicate move to win the position. But he walks right into check over his plan. Boom shakalaka. <laughs> I wonder if check over said that. Probably not. So big blunder by Makaganov, and a big win by Chekover, because Makaganov is pretty strong as well. Uh, even though he was losing, like we said, um, he still got him at the end, and I think it was because of this g5 move. Chekover is pretty tricky, no doubt about it. g5, not the move I would play, but allowed for these tactics at the end on the f-file that we saw. I'm not saying that he calculated all the way to queen h4 check from here. Probably he didn't, because uh, you know a lot of those moves weren't, weren't necessarily forced. Although they were best for white. So he, he could have. He could have. 
but uh, very interesting stuff by Checkover, and, and he had a really good, uh, really good comeback win here. Let's go on to uh, one more, probably the last one. I actually have two, but this one, uh, yeah, this one's pretty nice. So we'll look at this one. He's playing some guy I never heard of. He's got a lot of names. It'll, uh, I'll just edit in the name, you know, you'll see it. F Fyodor. F Fyodor? I don't know, maybe somebody knows how to... Well, I'll just call him Ivanovich, even though that's obviously his middle name. Because uh, it's got Fitch in there. Ivanovich. So, he's playing our friend Ivanovich. <laughs> and Checkover's got white, so we got to flip it again. Every time. Dang it. I, I should have planned that better. Um... So the guy doesn't like that the queen and the rook are lined up. So Ivanovich, he moves his queen. Get that out of there. And Chekhov's like, come on, let's, uh, don't you want to be friends with the rook? Ivanovich declines. And I will say that Chekhov is, is winning with some normal moves. By normal, I mean moves that don't change the character of the game. For example, h4. For white, white can play h4. Just a solid move that keeps a winning position. Um, he's winning in the long term, and his bishop on b1 is amazing. That's what you have to understand about this position. The bishop on b1 is much stronger than any, any piece currently um, for black. I mean, even including the queen on d7, right? It's not as influential as the bishop on b1. Well, it does have more potential. <laughs> not gonna lie. But Chekhovar actually finds a really nice tactical sequence to win him the game basically by force immediately. And even though the computer doesn't play this way um, at first, it still is, like, the best way to go in practice because it wins by force with forcing moves. And sure, you can do any normal move and be winning, but you might as well take a forcing win if you've got it. So this will definitely be the time to pause and try to find a forcing way forward for Chekhover. Alright, hopefully you at least considered the move. Knight takes g6. Not the only winning move like I was mentioning. Um, and maybe there's even some other forcing moves that are interesting here. But knight takes g6 is definitely the way to go if you see it. You have to calculate it pretty deeply here. So feel free to pause at any moment and try to calculate if you uh, didn't guess the last move, you know. Knight takes g6. And uh, the next move is kind of, uh, kind of, you know, the point. Like, once you see knight takes g6, you'll probably consider queen f6 in this position. And he plays knight h8. And one thing that chess base does wrong is that it says knight f h8, when only one knight can go to h8 here because the other one's pinned. But, um, you know, this was, the, this was the move that I would personally not find, uh, but he definitely found it before he played knight takes g6. Rook e6. Piling on in a um, sort of a slow fashion. Right? Not necessarily going for the direct win. Um, but this move has a lot of good points. For example, you might say, oh, just play queen g7, what's the problem? Here comes queen f4 check. See, we pin the knight again so that we can move our queen to f4 with check and keep the attack going. So he goes for rook g8. He figures his rook is over in the corner doing nothing. Might as well bring it into the defense, right? But here's the uh, coup de gras. Is that what it's called? <laughs> Definitely, if you didn't find this variation, which I wouldn't expect most people to, you should pause it up here and, and find the, the finishing blow. Check over play to move that we all hope to play, right? Sacrifice our queen. <laughs> queen takes h8 check. Double x clam. Have to take with the rook, of course, because the knight's pinned, and you can't really let him take and just play king g5. That would be pretty horrible. Rook takes g6 check. Only legal move. And then he wins back his queen. Beautiful forcing variation by Chekhover. Because um, this is discovered check, don't forget. And it'll win the queen, be up a bishop and two pawns for the easiest win ever. 
um, Ivanovich has to resign, and he does. Beautiful tactic there by Chekover. He really, uh, really had his mojo working here when he sacrificed the knight. There's no doubt in my mind that he saw till the end of the game from here. Uh, knight g6 is the only move. Knight f h8 is... It's the only move because not only are we threatening on g6, but if he plays a move like rook g8 to defend g6, we also have rook e7, because don't forget that it's pinned again. So this is actually the only move knight h8. Rook e6, the only winning, I think that's the only winning move even. And then again, he's got a couple of options here for black, um, but after rook g8, he, he could calculate that pretty easily in his sleep, really, I would say. Really nice stuff by Checkover. And uh, I'm pretty sure we didn't do a great players of the past about Checkover. Um, you know, I searched it up on my YouTube, but uh, he definitely had some really nice tactical combinations. Um, he was definitely a tricky player. Uh, he definitely did a great job also of putting himself in positions to create combinations. That's something that I always admired about uh, Alyekin, actually. Alyekin was really good at, at forcing complicated tactics. You know, it's not like he just showed up at the board and then there's a tactic for him. He put himself in that position. And Chekhov was really good at doing that, too. Uh, obviously not quite as strong as somebody like Alyekin, but still a great player of the past. Well, that's all I have for you today. If you enjoyed, please consider to leave a like and subscribe to the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta's YouTube. Thanks. Bye-bye.